Hello, I'm Nathan. This video is the first of what I hope are several presentations on ancient historic games. And I've chosen to start with one which is both fairly simple to describe and definitely has some history behind it. That is Nine Men's Morris. Now, the game you may recognize from its very distinctive board, which is three concentric squares interconnected with lines, each square with eight spaces, making 24 spaces in all, or points as they're called. The game is known variously as Nine Men's Morris, Mills, Marls, or Nine Penny Marls, among other names. And as I describe the game and its background, you'll get more of an idea about where those names come from. It's best known as a medieval English game and has several references, including in Shakespeare and Chaucer. However, the board, that particular shape of it, has given some clues as to the further history of the game. In particular, boards like these have been found drawn or etched into the walls and floors of buildings that were part of the ancient Roman Empire. And there's a reference to a game with a very similar board and play style in the works of Ovid, dating back to the 8th century BC. So we know that a game like this, very much like it, was played that far back. And it's thought that the game's name probably has a Roman origin in the Latin word merilus, meaning a counter or game piece. So the pieces used to play, of which there are nine per side, nine pennies, nine men, uh, very likely gave the game its name. There are very similar boards that have been found in ancient Egyptian tombs and in archaeological sites in India and China. So the game may go further back, or at least the structure of the board and the style of play. It's also been found to be rather similar to certain depictions of Celtic cosmology, that is, three worlds, each with four or eight directions or parts. Uh, sometimes there is a Morris square, very similar to the board, that's used to depict this cosmology. But as with most things having to do with geometric signs, it's difficult to tell which came first. The board, the design as a spiritually significant figure, the game, or the cosmology possibly borrowing it as an illustration. So, no specific evidence that I know of to say which is which. All right. As I discuss play here, I'm going to focus down on the board itself and start showing what it looks like and how it started. All right. Starting with setup for Nine Men's Morris, the first thing you'll need is the Morris board. And again, that's that distinctive geometric shape of three concentric squares, each with eight points lacking the center. Then with these axis lines connecting the middle points on each side. Now you can buy these boards pre-bought. This one I purchased or had purchased for me as a gift from a company called Seven Oaks Grove in Washington State, also called Creative Imaging. And the flip side of the board is a Toffle board, which is a, another northern uh, strategy board game, hopefully the subject of a future video. You can also draw this board on paper or etch it into a stone, in a board, the way the ancient Romans did, however you like. The other thing you'll need is counters. Again, this is a two-player game, so you'll need two sets of counters, nine each of two different colors. These are wooden pieces, not originally with the game. However, there's a variation now out for sale with wooden pieces. Besides that, then you need to decide which player is going to go first. Traditionally, dart goes first. However, uh, you have to decide which player gets that color. So you can roll two dice and see who gets the higher number. Alternately, put all the pieces in a bag and shake them up. Take turns picking and whoever picks dark first goes first. Or one player can take the two colors, mix them up, hold one of each color hidden, and the other player chooses. And 
If they pick light, they go second. If they pick dark, they go first. Once you know which player is going first, you can go on to the first phase of the game, which is placement. And again, Nine Men and Morris is called a place and move style board game. There are several others of that type in historic and modern games. You'll probably recognize one of the modern variations when I start talking about those at the end. For Nine Men's Morris, the player that goes first chooses a piece, one at a time, and places it on any open point in the board. So we'll have dark start here in the middle of a few lines and control that space. It's usually a smart play, but you may want to vary it. Light in response, chooses and places a piece. Now you alternate between the two players placing. The primary goal of placement is to create a line of three tokens adjacent to one another and in a straight line, a connected line, horizontally or vertically. This is called a mill, these three pieces. When one player forms a mill, they can then remove one of their opponent's pieces from the board and from play. It's out of the game. So that's why you want to try to form one whenever possible and block your opponent from forming mills whenever you can. Otherwise, you start losing your pieces. When removing pieces from the board, just as a sample setup, the rule is that you must always, if possible, remove pieces that are not in mills. So if Dark's just completed this mill, they must first remove this piece. As these three are in a line, they're already in a mill. Now, if you're removing pieces from the board, and all of your opponent's pieces are already in mills, then you can remove any piece you choose. Likewise, if there are multiple pieces not in mills, you can choose any of those. So, in this case, Dark could remove any of the light pieces in that mill. Now I'm gonna go through a little bit of sample play and set up the board. Go through a full round of placement in order to move on to the second phase of the game, which is movement. So you're welcome to skip ahead to the next section uh, or you can watch and see if you can follow my sa sample play. Note, most of the time players are going to be trying to either form mills or stop their opponent from doing so. So here we go. Starting with dark, they choose here, light chooses here. Dark is going to take this space like counters. Dark moves to here. Light counters. Dark's going to take this space, countered. Dark takes that one, countered. Where else shall I go? about here. Now, dark's not created any mills yet, so light gets a chance to start trying to build them. Uh, yes. See, they've gotten stuck. They can block that one, but not that one. Dark doesn't have any pieces in mills, so I can choose and remove one. Well, obviously I want to take that one off. And Dark says no. Puts it right back. Okay, how about here? That's a good placement for light side. Now, once all the tokens have been placed and any opponent tokens removed, then you move on to the movement phase. In this second phase, you continue to take turns alternating, starting back again with the first player. And during each turn, a player can move one piece from a point to an adjacent point along a line. Now with this movement, a piece cannot jump across without a line drawn between the two points. And it also cannot jump over opponent's pieces. That has to be from open point to adjacent open point. Again, the purpose of movement is to try to form mills. 
to start removing opponent's pieces from the board. Uh, if you're unable to do so, then you should be thinking about blocking an opponent's mills or starting to set up your own down the next move or so. So, let's see. It starts with dark. They can't block this mill. What are they going to do instead? I move this piece. Light responds by moving and creating a new mill. And in reprisal, we're going to take that one off. Now, it's Light's turn again, and they can do something called breaking. That is, you can move a piece out of an existing mill. So they move here. Smart, it blocks that space anyway. You can then, on Light's next turn, Move that piece back, recreate the same mill, and remove another opponent's piece. Now, in some game parlance, this is called pounding. That is, breaking and then reforming the same mill over and over indefinitely if you can, if one of those pieces doesn't get removed. Uh, should note that some game terminology refers to pounding any time that you form a mill during movement. Sometimes it's specific to breaking and then reforming a mill. So just be aware when you read different rule sets. Now this back and forth continues until one of two conditions is met. Sometimes during movement, a player's pieces are all boxed in. They're all bounded on the sides by opposing tokens. And on that player's turn, they no longer have any legal moves. They cannot move a piece from one point to another. At that point, the trapped player is stuck and they lose the game. The other player wins. So something to be aware of during placement and movement is to not get yourself boxed in and unable to move at all. This can especially happen when pieces are removed down to just a couple that can be completely surrounded. Alternately, when one player is reduced to only three pieces on the board, the movement phase also ends, and you move on to a third phase called flying, which I'll play through the game here and likely get to that phase. So again, if you want to skip forward to the third part, be my guest, or you can watch and I'll play through a few more turns of movement. So, light has just broken this mill. Dark doesn't have many uh, responses available, unfortunately, uh, but one thing they can do Maybe start commanding this area. Okay, pounding. They're going to take out this piece. Dark's response. No more breaking that mill. It's stuck. What am I going to do in response? Well, we're certainly going to block that mill. Move this one. Nothing they can do about it. Let's get that one out of the way. Dark's response. Here. This is a very bad game for Dark. They made a mistake early on in placement. Boop. No, you don't. You see here, by the way, I was talking about blocking. These two Dark pieces are blocked. They've got no escape path because of the light pieces in their way. So only these center two can move. They're pretty doomed. All right, let's do this. And pound again. Let's take out this one. All right, bad game for dark. Now we move on to the third phase, which is flying. 
Now this is an optional phase for some players. They want to stick with just movement. The game becomes a faded thing for the player that's behind at that point. However, flying gives a chance, a slim chance, to the losing player. In that case, they, their movements can be jumping pieces from any point to any other open point anywhere on the board. Now they can legitimately jump. So, because of Light's last move, Dark has only three pieces on the board. If they had a ready mill already set up, they might have a chance, but in this case, they don't. However, we're going to do our best. Light, uh, Dark is going to try to be smart. Block that easy break space. Light does this. Another fly. Unfortunately, Light can just form that mill again and take out the third to last piece for Dark. Now at this point, Dark has only two pieces remaining on the board. They can no longer form mills and the game is over. Dark loses, Light wins. So whenever a player has only two pieces remaining on the board, that's the other losing condition. All right. I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to talk a little bit about variations of the game. And that is Nine Men's Morris in its most common form as it's generally played. As I mentioned before, there are several variants that have been played in different times and places that any which you can try. The simplest is Three Men's Morris. As you might guess, it's played with three pieces for each player on a much simpler board, as I'll show on the screen. That is a three by three square with the center point with lines connecting uh, all points, that is the horizontal, vertical, and diagonals. In its first phase, again, players take turns placing their pieces. Although in this case, if you get three in a row, you win the game. That might sound similar to a very similar game, tic-tac-toe. It's not certain whether one game or the other came first, if they were just closely related because of the shape, uh, but they're certainly very similar. The difference being in Three Men's Morris, once the players are done placing their pieces, if no one's gotten three in a row, then it goes on to a movement phase where players take turns moving one piece at a time until they get three in a row, at which point that player wins. Then there are common variants, five, six, or seven men's Morris, which are played on a smaller version of the board with just two concentric squares. Five men's Morris is sometimes called smaller Merrells. Again, Merrells being a variant of Mills or Marls. And seven men's Morris, again played with seven pieces, sometimes adds the center dot and a cross connecting that, uh, giving one more possible path for three in a row. Then in larger variants, there's 10, 11, or 12 men's Morris. Now, 11 or 12 men's Morris usually adds diagonal lines connecting the corners on the board, but otherwise the same three concentric squares. And again, played with 10, 11, or 12 pieces. 12 Men's Morris, the largest version, is also sometimes called Marabaraba in South Africa, where it's actually a national sport. So as you think of chess as a game with a large following, so 12 Men's Morris or Marabaraba is in South Africa. Uh, 10 Men's Morris has another variant called Lasker Morris, named after the creator. And in this variation, there is no division between the placing and moving phases. That is, players alternate turns and they may either place a piece or move a piece, alternating at any point. And it continues until all nine pieces have been placed, at which point a player can then only move. So, as you can see, 
for a basic game structure, this place and move type of board game, there are a lot of variations just with the same rules. I hope that you've been interested and would like to give Nine Mins Morris a try, but have a great game no matter what you play.